Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Dr. Jeremy Koenig from Athletogen. On this episode, Jeremy and I discuss many topics, including Jeremy's background and his influences. We discuss DNA information and how this can potentially enhance athletic preparation and performance. I asked Jeremy about the biggest lessons he has learned so far in his life and career. Jeremy gives the listeners and viewers his top life advice and resources. I asked Jeremy if he only had one year left to live, how would he spend that year and why? And finally, I asked Jeremy the big question. If he could invite five people to dinner, dead or alive, who would he invite and why? Guys, this was an absolutely fantastic episode with Jeremy. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Jeremy, we are rocking and rolling and recording. First off, thank you so much for making time to speak to me today. It's, uh, it's been so long since we uh, actually spoke. Um, so it's really great even just to catch up and uh, really looking forward to getting into our topic today and wherever our conversation leads because, uh, you know, as the universe knows me and you would like to, like to discuss. Absolutely. Well, thanks for uh, your, I'll call it professional persistence because, I mean, there are a number of uh email exchange that we had which um you know my replies were uh always much longer than i wanted them to be and much shorter than they needed to be so i'm glad we're we're going to catch up in this time awesome so for the viewers and the listeners um who may not be too familiar with who we are and I'll, i'll link up to any previous podcasts that i've listened um where you were interviewed so you did a really good one obviously with uh kelly and juliet Sarret on the ready state did really good list that number of times you're one with melvin on the altus and uh dr bobs as i said before he we went online and there was another one too with the mendel's pod which i never heard before but so the, i'll link to those so people can get maybe a little more background and information than what we may discuss here but uh you're the the founder ca ceo of athletogen um, so maybe can you give us the whole background story of how you got to where you are today? So I know from listening to some of your podcasts that your mother was a big inspiration for you getting into this whole realm of genetics. So just give us the whole background, the whole story, and right to where you are now with Aletogen. Wow, you really just went right to family origins, huh? Yeah, absolutely, baby. We're talking, ge- we're talking genetics here, man. Yeah, well, I mean, I also know that you must have been, you had a chat with Dan Path recently as well, right? I did, I did. Yeah, anyway, okay. Um, well, you know, you, you, I'm good with that because that's actually where I was going to go. So you introduced me as the um, CEO and founder of Athletogen. And, you know, for folks who have uh, not encountered Athletogen yet or for um, those of you that have, um, you know, I'm just a 15-year-old boy who, um wanted to uh, understand biology better for for the sake of his mom. So my mom was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis when um, when I was young. And, you know, she said to me, uh, you know, don't worry, it's not genetic, you know, as, as like, you know, as any mother would, would they, she wouldn't want their children to be um, uh, having any anxiety uh, above and beyond what they already would have um, mm. dealing with that. But so anyway, my it kind of resonated with me because I was like, well, you know, what is genetics? And, and you know, if we understand genetics more, will that help? And um, I mean, truth be told, it really is before that time, I, I had more of a passion for writing and drawing. Um, so yeah, it was for personal reasons that I, I went down uh, a rigorous um, scientific path or scientific uh, journey to discover um, what I thought was um, you know, genetics, but I learned more. It was really, yeah, there's DNA as, as something that's important to all of us, you know, our, our human technology. Um, but how does that interface with the environment? So that mm-hmm. intersection, if you think about a Venn diagram, like two circles, like that intersection, nature, nurture, where those two things come together, um, that's life. That's the performance, right? So for the athlete, you know, knowing, you know, essentially, what you're coming to the start line with and how to nurture it accordingly um, and making the right decisions to ensure uh, your best finish, potentially a podium finish uh, is, is a uh, informed um, perspective and a guidance that comes from knowing 
uh, both both sides of uh, of the equation, if you will. So nature, nurture, and so so that's how I got into it. You know, I I, I, I went to school. I did my undergrad in biochemistry, molecular biology. My my PhD supervisor was uh, um, Dr. Ford Doolittle. He's a great mentor. You know, ton of stories there. Uh, maybe for another day. But um, you know, he was the guy that uh, proved Anne Morbillis's hypothesis of endosymbiotic theory. Um, as it relates to one cell eating another one yeah. and instead of like digesting it for food. Oh, well, let's, you know, harness it's like awesome uh, light harvesting and energy production power. So he proved that for plastids. And right down the hall from me was, um, you know, the guy who, who proved the same thing, you know, Dr. Michael Gray for um, mitochondria. And, you know, I only realized this yesterday, um, but in Star Wars, when the force is strong with the Jedi, you know, it's like, wow, they get a lot of midichlorines. And I haven't checked this with George Lucas, but it sounds like a hybrid of the word, uh, words of mitochondria and chloroplasts, right? Midichlorine. Mm. Um, and in the same way, you know, when, when we look at, um, you know, athletes, they can stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis. And we know, you know, for the folks listening, um, you know, mitochondria have been called the, uh, energy powerhouse or the ATP factory within the cell. Um, and of course, plastids turning uh, uh, light into energy. But, um, yeah. you know, so that, that, was, that was my perspective. It's very, um, I, uh, I call it more, my PhD was more metaphysical. And I think that's why I really thrived there because Ford was actually, as it turned out, was an artist. He was doing his bachelor degree in fine arts <laughs> as I was doing my PhD, he retired. He's like, I'm on sabbatical, so kid, you're gonna have to figure it out. So that was just the right amount of independence that I, I yeah, did. Yeah. Um, but the big thing that I learned from him, I mean, he was, so Ford was a guy that, I mean, challenged even the species concept, Darwin's tree of life, right? Mm -hmm. So if your mitochondria in every single cell of your body are in fact derived from an ancient evolutionary vestigial uh, event of an endosymbiotic event, well, actually each of your cells has a bacteria. And then, of course, I'm sure people are quite aware of the human microbiome. And wow, there's 10 times more, you know, microbial cells in and on your body than there are human cells. And it's like, yeah, yeah and they're making molecules where there's crosstalk to the mitochondrial symbiotes that are there. They're turning on and off genes. And even the genes that are in, you know, the, the eukaryotic host, I mean, have transferred back and forth to, to, to the mitochondria. So there's this obligate symbiosis. The short answer or the short um um, or high level point here is, um, is we're complex systems. Mm. And I was, I was just fascinated by that. And so I went on to do my postdoc, um, at, at Cornell with Dr. Ruth Lay, who, as it turned out, was pioneering the, the world of, um, the human microbiome. And I got to work on, um, the first ever infant microbiome case study as to like how the guts colonize over time. Um, submitted NIH grants to look at how do the human genome and gut microbiome interface and you know hey uh, how does this all tie back to to mom it's like well you know as it turns out certainly our immune systems um, have an effect on what kind of bugs we um, find in people and in our immune systems you know in a uh, call it inflammatory or hyperinflammatory state may accidentally make um, antibodies to antigens in bacteria mm. that could look like the um, myelin sheath, which is the thing that's degra degraded um, during during multiple sclerosis. So uh, after that, I was a professor for a while, but it, it, it wasn't um, scratching my itch, so to speak. So I, I went into industry and um, developed a, a genetic screen for reproduction and fertility. Um, and then I, I saw where where the science was and how the technology was going to be so accessible and uh, where, where I thought um, I could be helpful uh, was, you know, looking at, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, an area of, of um, human biology that's uh, uh, ignored, but certainly it's not considered when, when we do things like academic research. So if you want to try to get to the point, right, of say, you know, curing a disease, we look at the pathology. Why is it broken? Um, I've, I've thought that if we start to involve, you know, athletes in the conversation, um, we can start to understand and in fact honor, you know, not only how does it look when it's fixed, but what does it look like when 
when the systems are thriving. So, you know, Athletogen is very much, um, I mean, the vision hasn't, the mission hasn't changed since, since the beginning. I think um, the how always gets refined and that's based on the people that you meet, but the vision's always been unite and inspire the world, right? And, and for me, um, again, from the individual's perspective and even from you know, my own mother's perspective, a lot of um, the opportunity comes from empowering the individual to understand what it is that they have. Uh, so that's really you know, you know, what drives me today is, is, uh, and reinforces it more and more uh, as, as athletes come to benefit, as you know, um, fitness enthusiasts, people who are uh, taking charge of their, their bodies and their life as a result. Um, I'm, I'm energized when people say, wow, I would have never known this information. Thank you. So, why, oh, yeah. No, no, that's good. I'll, I'll stop there. Why did you go down the athletic route rather than the clinical route? Just given that, again, the sort of inspiration was more from your mother's MS. I think um, a lot of... It, well, it's simple. It's, it's translational knowledge, right? Okay. So papers that I wrote during my postdoc, they might have been cited, you know, hundreds of times. You know, um, information that we put out in the form of blogs is read tens of thousands of times. Yeah. So it's the awareness and the impact factor, right? Okay. You can affect more change um, by starting the conversation and, and broadening um, who can participate in that conversation. I guess, you know, one of the things for me, Robbie, was that, you know, as a, as a, as a, a Canadian scholar, I had, you know, multiple grants that I, I leveraged, um, you know, as a scholarship or research. Um, but at the end of the day, it was like, wow, how have I given back in terms of, you know, this, this, this federal money was meant to be used for, 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 for various initiatives as mm -hmm. defined by, by the government. So whether that be, you know, cure cancer, whether that be address the issue of type two diabetes or, uh, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I saw that kind of more generally as well is, is there was a bit of a gap between, you know, how I was speaking as an academic and how, um, the lay person might understand the impact and the significance of, um, those, those research findings as I just described them to you. Yeah. But if you put, if you put the technology in their hands, when I say technology, I mean their human technology, um, and you put them at the center of the conversation, um, it becomes a much richer dialogue. Um, and so that indirectly will come back and I think uh, greatly accelerate uh, our success in, um, uh, in the clinics. And that's, I think, true of any, uh, any great innovation comes from an interdisciplinary approach. So outside perspective, for example. I mean, my vision is that you don't, you shouldn't need to be a geneticist or spend 15 years and two decades in school learning this stuff um, to take advantage of it. And uh, so in as much as I might have physically um, removed myself from a clinical setting, I mean, that's still very much the standard um, that, that I embrace, but it's really about sharing that with with other people and bring them along i'm gonna ask this question because i think it's going to just give a lot more sort of perspectives this whole episode in terms of your biggest influences on you as an individual who have been your biggest influences and you know uh, this goes for both professional and personal and these could be influences either directly or indirectly so like you know indirectly could be an author that you read who could be dead for many years or directly could be someone like your PhD supervisor or a family member or whatever, but who have been your biggest influences and, and how has that led to the way you see and perceive reality and life? And, you know, sort of basically what has made Jeremy be Jeremy? Okay. I have two questions before I give you those answers. First thing is, am I going to be getting a bill at the end of this podcast? Like for this, like psychoanalysis you're doing on me? <laughs> Number one. So no, there's going to be no bill, right? No bill, I swear. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the second question I, I, I have is, um, can you tell me a little bit about the viewers? I want to make sure that I'm acknowledging. Different yeah, so, so the, I would say that the majority of the people who watch and listen to this are people 
who use fitness to increase their level of self-awareness and to use it as a vehicle for self-actualization. Wow. Cool. And I bet you some of them are named Tim and John and Rachel and Jennifer. So, so for those of you who are listening, I just said your name and this answer is for you. Um, Cause you guys have quite a following. Yeah. Um, so let me get back to the question. So the question was, you know, greatest influencers um, could be real, could be writers, could be um, anything, right? Yeah. What makes me, me? okay. Yeah. You know, the, the interesting thing is, um, let's, let's start with a, you know, common friend. Um, Dan Papp's incredible, obviously. Mm. He'll, he'll, he'll just go on and on and on and, and he'll just ask the question, which is getting to the virus, you know? All this stuff you're describing, Jeremy, is the pathology. So, like, what's the virus? You know, um, similar to you, frankly. Um, and and the thing that Dan and I talk, you know, a lot about is family origins, right? Understanding uh, that imprinting at an early age, which, um, qu quite frankly, it, it, it leads to a thought construct that might have been beneficial at the time uh, and might have allowed for your success for years. Uh, but you have to be very critical uh, of of um, of those origins and those biases as a result. Yeah. Because uh, as much as they may help you, they can hurt you as well Absolutely. by giving you a closed perspective. So, you, you know, Dan was like a you know a more a more recent kind of physical body form of of such an individual. Uh, along the way, uh, there there have been, I mean, some people that are just strangers. Um, Coaches, though, uh, like my 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 boxing career, that was that was mm. huge. It was kind of pre pre um, uh, university because I had a you know a bit of a uh, challenged youth um, without going into details. But you know these folks were they they cared, and they might have been ex cons. They were ex cons, and they they saw a road that I was going down, and they steered me away from it. Right, so. A lot of that just came to chance, being in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, there are people like that every day. One of, one of the kind of fun things that I've made a game out of is because I, I live out of, out of pocket so much, um, you know, where we are at this stage in the company. But even like Uber drivers that I've had, I've, I've actually recorded some pretty cool conversations where we talk about the meaning of life and love and, you know, what is I've had that. I've had that so, with, ta with taxi drivers. Yeah, yeah. So... I mean, there, there, there are so many individuals out there that I come to encounter, come to look for because I've encountered them with more frequency, maybe because I'm ready to hear them. But, um, you know, early influencers, even before all that, if we don't want to talk about family origins, like, so of course, like, you know, my mom had a, had a big, um, you know, role and, um, you know, I, I think making me more sensitive, um, than I would be otherwise. And, and then, you know, on the opposite side, my, my dad was a bit of a Zen master where he, you know, not your typical um, dialogue that you'd encounter between father and son, right? Like, for example, I call him on Father's Day. And he's got a British accent. Uh, he'd say, oh, Jeremy, call him on Happy Father's Day. Oh, Jeremy, you know what? bloody well stepped away from that role years ago so and i was like okay well then i just call him to say he's like screw you and he's like that's better right so um you know th those are kind of family lessons i guess of um not placing too much attachment or expectation on people so segue into uh much more kind of um intangible influences um and, and, and therefore thinking is uh, actually the book you showed me at the beginning. Alan Watts is one of my favorites. I have all of his uh, audios, audio collection. Yeah, this is it. So I'll put him in my head and uh, I just pretend I'm like, like Superman, like from the first one when Marlon Brando was, was his dad, because he sounds like in the cave of solitude, right? Yeah. Um, and, and as I said, it's, it's much more, um, more existential metaphysical thinking, but it gets me to a point to remember to be in the service of, of other people in this lifetime. So, um, yeah. So I gave you four, I gave, I gave you four explicit. So, you know, Dan, mom, dad, 
um, thousands of strangers along the way, and 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 Alan Watts is is one of my faves. You know, the the strangers one is only one I've come to appreciate more over the last let's say maybe eighteen months, two years, because James actually for sure from Olpec speaks about that. He's like, you know, he talk, he, you know, he was talking one day about mentors and mentees, and he says like he just brought up this in conversation he's like there's times where you just meet a stranger just for like 20 minutes half an hour and then you walk away and go holy shit like that was just a life-changing moment and mm-hmm. uh, there's a famous book called the celestine prophecy it's a fable like by uh is it james red redfield i think is his name is the other but celestine prophecy is the name of the book and uh basically one of the tenets in that is that every single interaction you have no matter who or what it's with you were meant to have you were meant to always learn something from that experience so that and then also conversation with james made me appreciate that with strangers so funny you mentioned the uber drivers because i did the same with taxi drivers i think it's it's like it's nearly like you nearly have more it's kind of this is an irish saying you're like you have more boldness is in like you're a little more willing to be like just get into a riskier straight into it like conversation because you kind of know i'm only in this car for five minutes like i'm never gonna see this guy again so you kind of just get right down to brass tacks and the conversation sometimes with tax drivers is absolutely amazing yeah that's that's kind of true but like i like to i want to have a really like high rating on uber like a five-star rating so i can't be too bold <laughs> I want, I want Uber driver to pick me up yeah true well, we don't I, well i don't i don't know if we have that here with our one because i don't I, I don't get taxis too often here so but uh listen that's great i really really do appreciate that um so jeremy moving on then to a uh, legend like when was that seed planted in your head? I know you said you did a bit of teaching, but then you went into industry. Like, was it something that was, has always been in your mind since you were that 15 year old kid or was it when you were in your undergrad or was it when you did your, your PhD or postdoc? Like, when did you go? I think this is where I want to go with this. Yeah. So it's a bit of both. Like, I think it was always, you know, when I said to you, like the vision hasn't changed, you know, unite and inspire the world. Like, the how evolves as you as you meet more people mm. so and, and and the what um you know in, in a sense is defined by the people you know who've helped you define the how um so you know if you look at the historical account athletic Gym was founded in 2014 mm. um I, I think i really got a sense that i was going to take that leap um probably around 2013 it didn't take me too long to to get it going um really because you know i i actually saw one the state of the industry two that i thought i thought people needed this three i knew that i could do it and i, and I knew i could do it because you know my, most people might say that you know academics don't make good entrepreneurs but uh where this comes back to to my supervisor ford like he just gave me so much freedom to fail if you will um where I mean, I didn't go in with a predefined project. I had to do, you know, my own kind of academic research or market research, if you will. Um, then I had to identify a void or a problem or a solution that I could bring, which is not dissimilar to from what you know, an entrepreneur might do. Then I had to raise money. Well, no, then I had to inspire a team around me. I had to rally a team around me. Mm-hmm. Any of the people that I published, you know, I had at least four additional authors because that's that interdisciplinary um, you know, strength that I was looking for. And then I had to raise money. So I had to apply for grants, et cetera. And then I had to publish it. I had to take it to market. I had to, you know, I had to talk to other people um, who were researching there and asking if it was indeed helpful. And I had to send it through a production process and, and, uh, and it had to be good. So I, I learned all those skills as an academic. and I didn't realize that I had been cultivating them uh, until I was working for um, uh, a DNA company. Hmm. And, and, and then I was like, oh, I could do this. I can do it better. And, and that's, that's how it started. Tell me the difference between testing and gathering information. Because I know you condone was the word you used in, in Kelly's podcast. You, you don't like people saying genetic testing or screening because you feel that puts it up to be like a, I passed or I failed. So like, why do you not really like the term genetic testing? Well, I mean, let me just be clear. It's not that I, 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 I like it or I don't. It's, it's my, my emotional attachment to it has nothing to do with it. It's just yeah. really more fact based. It's just inaccurate. Um, cool. And, 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 you know, words, words, words are a technology, right? Um, so we have to use those, the words we, we have to be very intentional about the words we choose. So if I use a word like test, that implies you can pass or fail. 
So to the near 7 billion people on the planet that have made it 3.8 billion years, if there was ever any test, you have passed it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So um, it's, not, it's not about you know, bring, bring that feeling of disempowerment. Now it, it's very, it's different from, this is where there's a difference in the clinical application, right? Like yeah. if you go in um, for a genetic screen or a test for, you know, Huntington's disease, which is a Mendelian trait, you can, you can know with certainty the outcome. Um, in that setting, that's, that's where the word has been derived as a, as a test or a di di diagnosis, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now we know that, you know, that's just one marker out of billions. Um, we know that how DNA is, is concerted uh, and regulated to, you know, essentially lead to this you know, symphony of life in the form of all the proteins that make us what we are, hair color, eye color, height, all that stuff. How that comes together, um, it's much more complex than that. And I think when you start to understand um, various aspects of our DNA that apply um, to your daily life and where you can be empowered to make proactive decisions. Uh, it's very important that from the beginning, we're not using a word like test, mm -hmm. you know? So if we start to think about the use cases for athletes, you know, wow. And it's all informational and perspectival. It really depends on where, what's that athlete struggling with? You know what I mean? Like, what do they want to do? What are their goals, et cetera? So, you know, one of the things we saw working with um, athletes at Altus, for example, they'd get to a phase of training load that would be higher and some athletes would report you know, decreased mood, decreased motivation, et cetera, et cetera. And what we found in, in that instance was uh, those athletes um, had lower levels of various B vitamins and were genetically predisposed to have those. And so that makes sense, right? You're just a higher energy demand. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, you're, you're, so therefore your B stores are depleted. I mean, we know the half-life of those goes through your system with the exception right. of what's ever stored in muscle and liver, but we know, you know, athletes are just ripping through that. Right. Um, so, so in that instance, it's really, Hey, how can, how could you optimize that with, 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 um, not data, but the insight that you derive from that data in the context of your, of your daily life. So, you know, I, I see athletogen as like a springboard to changing the dialogue around yeah. um, what it is that, that, that genetics means. You know, frankly, I don't even like using the word genetics. I like using the word DNA mm. uh, because people will use the word DNA like, hey, like, what's the DNA of your company? Or, you know, what's, you know, oh, wow, that's success, like that's in your DNA. People use that more, so people know there's an implicit strength in their DNA. But when we start to think about genes, people say, oh, you got good genes, or oh, you got bad genes, and it's just like, it's not a pair of pants, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so words are important, and, and you know, in particular, like what we do is, is, is not a test, so we wouldn't call it that. Yeah. What, what does the process then look like? So, um, like say to someone watching this, listen to this and they're like, so like, how, how do you go about gathering this information? Like, is it blood? Is it saliva? Like what, like now I, I obviously I, I've, I've heard you speak with this. So I, I know I have an idea what it is, but just for viewers and listeners, like how does this process work? Like, how do you gather my information and what happens once you get that? Like does, does it go to a lab and what goes on? Yeah. I'm going to show you. Give me two seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the Athletogen kit, cool. and, and I'm gonna, can I share my screen? You absolutely can, yeah. Okay, so here's what I wanna show you. Um, so here is the homepage. Uh, so this is all the information uh, on the various products that we offer. So if you go and you dig on the products here, um, oh, there's my calendar. If you dig on the products here, what you'll see is here are the various um, insights we offer, but there's also a collection kit if you don't have one. So you can click on that and you order this and it uh, literally ships to your house. And so you'd get this in the mail. And we've, we've tried to make this idiot proof with me as the idiot, um, because even though I've done thousands of DNA extractions, um, I remember when I first did 23andMe, 
you know, I got it. And I was like, of course I didn't read the instructions. Um, so we, we really tried to make them like super simple, like three steps. So like in the box, like you can't miss them. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, it's great. Because I, I screwed it up. Um, and we even use a different, um, collection device to, uh, to mitigate that. So here it is present. So all I do is with this Q-tip, I like grab my cheek cells and then, and I just literally put it in the solution. And, um, you know, I should say there's a barcode on here, uh, that, that folks just, you know, when they create their account and register they do that. And then, yeah, so they, they close the tube back up, um, put it back in the box, which by the way has return shipping. And you just, oh, wow. <laughs> you did, you really did. You really did make that idiot proof. Well, like I said, where I'm the idiot, because I, I screwed it up um, before. But um, in addition to that, if people have got their DNA from Ancestry, DNA, or 23andMe, um, we support that data format as well. Mm. Um, so if for the 15 million people that have already done this, um, we're waiting for you. And uh, so to that end, when you um, log into your account, so what you're about to show, this is what you get when you, when you get your results, is it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, we communicate with, you know, folks that have just um, uh, ordered uh, via email to update them along the way. But so logging in, then what you'll see is uh, your, your um, insights that you can, you can download. Uh, so you can see there's a welcome report. This is a new one that I'll talk about more in a second, which is really cool. Here's mm -hmm. the, the ready state. Uh, which actually includes videos. There, here's your nutrition report, etc. Athletic report. This is the one we're working on with Altis to combine that. You know, there's general wellness, and um, you know, there's descriptors of all these things here. But this is the one that we we launched recently that I just wanted to to share with you because it's it's really neat for those who've got you know um, ethnicity results, for example, mm, and mm. percentage. Um, what we actually did is we broke this down into functional categories as it relates to like how you fuel. So like what you eat, um, you know, your physiology, how you would perform, um, at sport. And what's really cool is if we look at the ancestral distribution or origins, sorry, the distribution of those origins, like you'll notice here, wow. So, uh, the genes that, that are informing me nutritionally seem to be predominantly, uh, Native American, um, but some influence from you know, African, etc. Uh, and then you go down to, hey, how do I train? There's more of a hybrid here of, you know, African and what's this color here? So East Asian and then influence from European. So what you're seeing is like these genes are, are known to be, or the, these genotypes or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, tend yeah. to be represented represented in those populations. So it's, it's not talking anymore about your overall ancestry. It's talking about potentially the functional origin um, of your genes and where you derive uh, that, that function, which in my mind, this comes back to Unite and Inspire. So now you can point to a population who you once perhaps superficially excluded yourself from and be like, wow, actually I'm kind of like them in this way, Yeah. right? And then, and then it just makes the conversation just more interesting. And it's actually now it's starting to happen above the DNA. Like DNA is the, is the guide, it's the signpost, but the thing that is awesome is you and how you manifest. So anyway, that, that was the, um, the customer journey that I just took you on. And that can take, if they upload their data, it happens in seconds from 23 meter ancestry. But if you order the kit that can take, well, you'll get it in two days, but depending on you and how quickly you get it back in the mail, you could have your results in anywhere from four to six weeks. Just a pure geek question from just purely for, for me. What does the actual process look like? So my saliva goes to the lab. Is it just in a centrifuge and they just like, it's like, is there an emulsifier and you just get the DNA out of it? Or what does that process look like? Yeah. So good question. Um, so the, the stabilizing solution that you see there, yeah. you know, it's, it's a fancy name for it is a, a PBS buffer. It's, it's just basically, it may as well be dish soap and ethanol. Yeah. Um, so that is going to disrupt the, the um, phospholipid bilayer. The bilayer. 
and the uh, ethanol stabilizes the DNA. And then you go through various washes to pull out all the cellular debris and spin down the DNA itself. Uh, and then we use a, a microarray analysis, which is effectively, because DNA is double-stranded, mm -hmm. when you heat it, because it's hydrogen bomb, bonds, these band, this, the two strands um, dissociate. So like on the chip, you can imagine there's like this, these like, DNAs that are just waving around and at heated, and then we throw in your your DNA, and then depending on how they anneal on the chip that looks at you know millions of markers potentially, um, it'll actually fluoresce, and then the machine that's looking at that will be measuring the you know, kind of this bioluminescence at molecular level, mm. um, and then that's turned into uh, you know your digital file, um, which is your A's, your G's, your C's, your T's, which is the um, DNA alphabet. So that, that information comes back then to the athlete and the coach. Where do they go from there? Because I know I, I've heard you speak about that. That information now can change behaviors. And I think one thing I heard you say on Dr. Bub's podcast with yourself was around caffeine. And you were just like talking about you had this friend and he was like, you, you were spending some days with him and he was like, you want some caffeine or you want some coffee on some coffee? And you were like, okay. And then like you were like after like, like the third day, you were like, I could not take any more coffee. But my friend was just like, he could just have it all day yeah. long because obviously there was a different interaction there. And then you were saying, instead of you now using caffeine, just in general life, you prefer now to maybe use cold water strategies instead as your sort of maybe cortisol or sympathetic nervous system type hit. And um, so that kind of, that kind of, that kind of informed your behavior there. So how, how, how would you go about relaying that information out to an athlete or a coach saying maybe this behavior could be better? Yeah. So firstly, just the, the data only goes to the athlete. Oh, and whether, they, whether or not they share it with the coach, that's up to them. Um, but, you know, essentially we're bringing it back to like, uh, actually John Berardi, Dr. John Berardi of Precision Nutrition um, mm -hmm. highlighted this in his review of the genetic research. And, you know, what he talked about was while DNA on its own may not lead to a behavioral change, DNA in concert with, um, you know, an advisor, you know, professional coach, nutritionist, whatever, um, actually the um, program adherence and compliance and therefore efficacy of the results mm -hmm. go up. You know, you pointed to like one of like potentially a hundred different outcomes that may be relevant. Um, the key is finding out what, what's relevant to the athlete. And that comes back to like, you know, or the individual, that comes back to like having a conversation, right? So maybe like, you know, my sleep is, you know, I'm not sleeping enough. I'm only getting five hours. We can look at sleep genetics. We can look at, you know, your circadian rhythms. What are you more naturally to be a morning person or a night person? Do you have the flexibility uh, in your work schedule and your life schedule to change that and leverage what you do naturally? And if not, you know, for example, if you're if you are uh, not a if you're a night owl but you want to go to bed earlier, like the um, recommendation um, can can change to to you know offset that genetic predisposition so you know mm. definitely no social media definitely get a blue light blocker um for for any of the the screen that screens that you absolutely must watch i mean you know here's chamomile tea and here's a magnesium hot magnesium bath three hours before so there's a ton of all these things that you can do which on their own don't sound super impressive but what's impressive is the individual comes to know themselves so well mm. uh so that they can they can essentially optimize those things about uh, themselves um, to achieve a goal. It just, it allows them to make better informed decisions. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, and, I, and you say, I'll say that with removing the word just, because we make so many decisions that are not informed. So it allows true, them to make informed decisions. And uh, yeah, and, and people are excited to learn more too, right? Like, you know how cigarettes were like the gateway drug? That's what yeah. I was <laughs> I, I see DNA as being like the gateway to health, you know, like some people say, Oh, well, do you even need to, you know, DNA and you know, you could just like get all this in your health history. And I was like, yeah, well your health history becomes more informative as you approach death. So let's um, be a little more proactive about it. But what we find is yeah, people yeah. interest in their bodies. And if DNA is an inexpensive way to do it. Um, yeah. That's, that's what really gets me excited. And I'm not alone. So a few other things come to mind. Um, and, and Kelly Surrett brought, brought up this point on, on the interview with him, which I thought was very good, um, about 
you know, you kind of already referenced this slightly already in that who owns the information. And I think you said this, this kind of goes to the core belief of a Lettigen in that you're very much with the athlete in this, in that, you know, the information is theirs because there is this sort of scared mindset of some athletes and professional organizations, you know, with all this um, data information being gathered on them that it can be used against them, you know, like, so if certain indicators could say, well, this guy is more predisposed to an injury uh, or this guy doesn't recover as well. Therefore he may be an injury risk, which may cause the organization more money. Okay. We're not going to, we're not going to draft this guy. Let's just say in that instance um, or certain things like that. Like maybe if there's some marker that, that just shows a lessened longevity in, a, in an athletic career in some individual. So if there is some athletes out there in some organizations who are a bit wary or scared with this data collection. And I've heard you say that, well, the, first of all, it should purely be only the athlete who gets this first of all, and it's up to them if they want to share it or not. So it, do you want, just want to touch into that? Yeah, I mean, so you're right. It, sh- it should be only the athlete that owns it. And with athletic, it is the own, only the athlete, the individual that, has access to the data, but you know, the, 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 the point that you're addressing or raising isn't one that's um, specific to DNA. I mean, you probably remember, you know, the NFL PA oh, yeah. trackers, being, yeah, uh, yeah. contract negotiation, whatever. I mean, the, you're, you're, you're tacking onto like a bigger issue uh, that, that is not new and that's the misuse of information. Mm. We've seen that manifest more recently with Facebook as an example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is like, information. Yeah. yeah, like I've heard the teams play. I've heard the teams where players won't track their sleep even because they're like, I'm not tracking my sleep because like the, their whole thing is you, you like that's getting to my privacy. If I want to stay till two a.m. in the morning with a friend or making love to my wife, like you, you know, you should be getting my my sleep data for that. You know. Yeah. So certainly there is like the, you know, in, with each individual, it's different. Like to what level of privacy do they demand, and mm. that's their choice, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, let's just make sure we put to, to bed the DNA privacy. Um, issue here is so there's there's no way anybody's getting an athlete's data unless that athlete chooses to share that data. Condones it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, with with respect to some of the more actionable stuff like nutrition, I can't. I mean, there really is. I mean, are you really going to use that against an athlete? Like, are you really going to ban an athlete because they're allergic to dairy or eggs? <laughs> You know, or need more B vitamins. No so like, celi- no celiacs, you're gone. Well, exactly. So I think that, um, you know, some of the other stuff, like the like the physiology and how you adapt, I mean, I think a lot of that comes back to, again, this is translational knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. It's why it's so important that people understand what the DNA is saying when we talk about things like injury risk. So Achilles tendon rupture, that might matter to a long jumper probably not going to matter to a swimmer unless they get it in their heads. They should be doing box jumps, which they shouldn't be. Um, so a lot of this stuff, uh, what's, what's truly important is the context. And frankly, if I'm running an organization, if I'm a GM or I'm an owner of a team, I'd want players who took the initiative to get the best information about themselves so that they could make informed decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'm saying now then is I'm looking to those folks to lead this, right? So the GMs and the owners and saying like, yeah, like we um, want athletes to discover these things about themselves. I mean, there are a ton of organizations, uh, you know, outside of pro sport, you know, boutique, you know, fitness centers where athletes train and they train in private and they nurse their injuries in private because they don't want the teams knowing about them. Yeah. yeah. That is, that's a broken system, right? So this, this has nothing to do with DNA. This has everything to do with empowering your team. Mm-hmm. And you need to empower the individual to know themselves. And after all, that's the point of life. So, so anyway, that's, that's uh, where we're at with, with them. Yeah, and, and uh, just, just uh, to be clear, I, I definitely wasn't saying that that was only related to DNA testing because it's, it's, it's in, it's, a, as you said, it's a way bigger issue. It's all data collection that, that, uh, that issue is around. Well, look, if DNA has to be, uh, you know, the topic that brings and reminds people of all, you know, this, this, this other, you know, operating system that's out there that can be optimized. I mean, I, I think that's great. Mm. Um, so, but, but the point is here, um, you know, if an athlete goes ahead and gets a nutrition report from us, 
you know, it's not going to their team unless they take it there. It's not going to their dietitian unless they take it there. Mm. So the, the next question I'm going to ask is probably one that I'd say people watch or listen to this are probably wanting me to ask. And it's it. And it will be, can the information that they gather from Athletogen, can it show them talent um, identification? Like, can it show someone's proclivity to a particular sport? What is talent identification? I, I don't know. <laughs> so how do I answer that question? Does this thing do this thing that we don't even know what it is? I, I suppose uh, what people would be thinking is, can that information show a proclivity to certain traits that are highly correlated to talent within certain sports from, I say more so from maybe a physical, and I don't even know if you could get some cognitive emotional aspects known as well. Well, let's go back to that Achilles tendon example. So when we worked with Altus, what we found is in the jumpers and the sprinters is that there was a 50% representation of the protective marker wow. associated with a stronger, less vulnerable Achilles tendon. Now, if we look at the general population, I mean, it's between like 7 and 9%. Oh, yeah. So, and these athletes, keep in mind, they're like in their mid-20s. So if they're still there, they've probably dodged a few injuries because of their genetics, but let's not forget about the other 50%. How mm -hmm. are they there? Right. Um, and how actually, by the way, might, when might we even decrease that over representation by bringing better training modalities? Yeah. yeah. By being proactive about changing surface surfaces, by listening to the athlete's individual need about training load. Right. And what's the minimum effective dose that they need? Mm. to achieve that world record performance. So the, the direct answer is, um, well, some people might talk about talent identification and that's how DNA can be used or misused. Uh, the fact is, and we see this actually in agriculture, if we move towards a monocrop, that's going to be a disaster. Disaster, yeah. Right? The true richness in what it is, uh, what it means to be human or what human potential means is is that diversity yeah and i mean how many athletes do you see break the mold and how exciting is that when they do the same bolt shouldn't have been a sprinter because how tall he was and if he was in the u.s he would have been a basketball player mm -hmm. but he had to like beg his coach to run the 100 he's supposed to be a 2-4 guy because they identified him as a talent for the 400 look how long his legs are yeah obviously he should do the four mm -hmm. you're never going to be able to get up to top speed fast enough to do anything in the hundred misinformation misunderstanding misguided principles uh so yeah um i think i think talent identification is uh as we just learned is is a word that's thrown around and people don't necessarily know what they mean when they're saying where where do you see um where do you see all this going within the next you know decade and currently what what excites you most now with athletogen in terms of going forward in the future so the, the thing that's exciting right now is that people get it. You know what I mean? Like, like four years ago when I was at, at Altis and I was talking about here's how genetics could inform the conversation, there were people just in just stark opposition to what it is that I was saying. And what I learned was I wasn't being clear. I wasn't being communicative. I wasn't saying things in a way that people understood or what I, that I meant. And, you know, the ACP, that athletic, um, sorry, um, apprenticeship coaches program that Altus puts on, the one last week Kelly Strett was at, you know, we announced our, you know, Ready State Mobility WAD product, which is a really cool one that, you know, with your DNA points you to like videos that you should watch um, as it relates to your injury vulnerabilities. Um, but in, in that audience is there were, you know, four different organizations that we worked with. And, and then people were saying, well, not me. I, I'm just, I don't even talk anymore. I've learned that that's better not, not to talk sometimes. <laughs> but the number of times that it came up, oh, well, you know, that, there's a genetic component there. You know? and, and then I'll ask, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? So people innately know that, there, of course, there's a DNA component. I think previously where we where we saw the conversation was it's too early it's too early it's too early you know and now people are realizing well what we know 
about neuroscience and what we know about physiology mm. is the tip of the iceberg. And it's like, it's too early to take first principles and, um, you know, use these theories and turn it into a practical application and test and retest. I mean, I think what you're seeing, especially with Altus, is there is an honoring of the scientific method and transparency and collaboration. And so in that context, um, having DNA as part of the conversation, in fact, uh, Altus was our first partner and, mm. you know, they were skeptical and that's, that's perfect. Yeah. Great. Expose all, like, help me take my rose colored glasses off because I've been living in this space for two decades. Where do you see the shortfalls? Where do you see how this is not useful? And it, it effectively comes back to uh, a more artful communication, mm. right? Listening more. Uh, I mean, the first product that we made, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like if I had this when I was an athlete, I would have done X, Y, and Z. And I forgot that. Well, here's a couple of things. One, I'm a retired athlete. And two, um, you know, I have my PhD in genetics. So, what I just did was make a product for me and I was very selfish. So the, to summarize, the thing that I'm really excited about is, you know, we're developing our product, our technology in collaboration with the customer, right? Or the partner, as I like to refer to them. Yeah. Right? So that, that is really cool. Now, if you rewind and you think about where I came from and it's like, no, only gene geneticists can, can talk about DNA. Now, like, like, the conversation that like some of these athletes are having with me are blowing me away. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have ever thought of that. Yeah. And, and that's really what it's about is, is um, bringing that interdisciplinary approach to arguably the most important technology that we've will ever have. And the one that we've been ignoring all our lives. So that that's our DNA, right? Sorry. The future, the future, um, that I'm excited about, Robbie, is, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it draws on the books that you cited, right? You know, talks about Alan Watts and talks about the Celestian Prophecy and all these, you know, spiritual guides that are really, I think, pointing people like to themselves, mm -hmm. right? And um, in a way, DNA is, uh, you know, I use the word signpost or I use, um, you know, there, I can't remember which movie it is, but with Bruce Lee, when he, he's with his student, he, he's like, pointing to the moon and the student looks at his finger and he like smacks him and he's like, don't look at the finger or you'll miss all the heavenly glory, right? So the moon. And so I think that like DNA is, is it's the finger right now. Mm -hmm. It is the signpost, right? It's like, oh wow, cool, I'm awesome. So, and, and that awesomeness that I have, I see it in other people and that's that whole namaste thing that people say at the end of yoga class, right? So I, I think that I'm excited about a future where people actually feel that respect for themselves and others yeah uh and and we collectively define what it means to innovate um knowing more about human potential yeah what would you say have been the biggest lessons you've learned so far in your life in my whole life up until now yeah the biggest learning learning experiences you've had so far would be like one or two or three or sometimes i word this as like you know what have been sort of big mistakes but you took away massive experience and learning from those mistakes and then really they're not mistakes and they were just learning opportunities mm, yeah um let me think take all the time you want man well here's one more recently actually and actually no i'm not finished with that one um The art of the pause, that's, that's the first one, right? So don't make assumptions, don't be reactive, be responsive, mm. right? Uh, a lot of people say, well, no, but my gut. Yeah, sure, great, trust your gut. Um, but first understand why your gut feels that way. Like what assumption did you make uh, to feel that way? Or was there a miscommunication? Awareness of awareness. Sure, sure. But like I call it the art of the pause. So if somebody says something to me that I think was offensive, or wrong, or just dumb, or reckless, they could have totally not meant it that way, right? Um, but they, they said it in a way that that's what it sounded like. And 100% people would say, yeah, that's what it sounded like. But, oh my gosh, yeah, I see that. I totally didn't mean that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then even the pause of like, am I interpreting this properly, right? So 
uh, that's the art of the pause. And in that space, um, you, you get to ask questions. And that, I think, gets you to meaning and, and a more meaningful outcome. Uh, and so, so that's the first thing is I've, is I've learned to, to pause. And, and, and because in that pause, the next obvious thing for me to, to think about doing was to ask a question. The byproduct of that is, oh yeah, remember when like I was four and it was cool and energizing and be curious. So I think like allowing for that curiosity, allowing for not knowing, uh, asking questions, you, you better understand what it is people are really asking mm -hmm. of you, from you. And, um, and then there's, there's this idea of, you know, compression of time, right? So we have a window of time to, to get everything done that we want to get done in this lifetime. And, you know, there's a lot of this talk going on about, oh, you know, behavioral change and, you know, you got to implement a new habit. And more recently, I've been thinking about uh, habits that most people might think of as destructive or, in, or inhibitors. But like, how do you repurpose those? Yes, right? Yeah. So I'm a huge procrastinator. I'm a huge champion of ADD. Like the teacher moved me from the middle of the class to distracting people. She moved me to her desk and then that was distracting her. And then she moved me to the back of the room under the coats. Uh, mm. You know, <laughs> I could be um, not a bother to anybody. And you know, that's not a good lesson. That's like, wow, the way I think and the way I am is very bothersome to people. So it's like, okay, well, how can I change that so that it's not? Um, and that comes back to the first two points is, you know, pause, be curious. Um, and so, and then I think you can develop your own standards uh, of operation, which by the way, will change. Like you hear all this stuff like, you know, Tim Ferriss, tools of Titans, like what's your morning routine? Well, don't get caught up in the kata, like the, the patterns, like the, the martial arts pattern. And oh my gosh, if you miss that one, the whole world falls apart because yeah. that's not what it is that you're looking at is your, uh, you need to, you need to embrace your, your strengths in, in, in so far as they, they don't work against you. Yes. And in the same way, you can embrace a perceived weakness and that becomes, you know, the whole obstacle is the way type mm, of thing, mm. right? So, and by the way, I haven't figured it out. I may like call you tomorrow and be like, hey, those three things that I said as like the most important factors that are directing my life actually have a bigger re revelation and all those things are wrong. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I guess being open to you know, things day to day is, is really what to take away from that. Just with the pause, it always reminds me of Stephen Covey's fourth habit, seek first to understand, then to be understood. You know, so kind of always asking the why before you, you know, before you, you make an assumption. And also to the, the book, The Four Agreements, and a fantastic book, and one of the agreements in there is to never make assumptions. So I, I, I always go back to that. And I suppose, well, because I'm, I was so influenced by Bruce Lipton, Joseph Shields and Pierce, and Jock Fresco, those three gentlemen, Lipton was the guy who introduced me to epigenetics and made me have an, an awareness and appreciation for like environment and organism and how the environment shapes an organism. And then when, when you talk about humans, then like what separates us from all the other animals and organisms is that we can choose to either react or respond to our environment. So, you know, so yeah, yeah. Like, so we, we, have, we can perceive our, our environment and it's kind of again, coming to the awareness again, that we can choose our perception. Um, and then with, with Pierce, Joseph Chilton Pierce and Jock Fresco, they just made me realize that everyone, everything is the way there for a reason. And when you kind of appreciate that and come to awareness that you always need to kind of step back and rather than trying to condemn or make a judgment, ask why, like, why did that person do that? Why is that situation the way it is? And try and have compassion and empathy and understanding and show some discernment. I suppose Dalai Lama too, his writing too, been very good. I always love the Dalai Lama because like the way he writes, it's just like, he's always like so happy. Do you know what I mean? And uh, it's so funny because like uh, he often talks about like, you know, this concept of, you know, you just, you don't need to be religious to be a spiritual person. Like, you know, being spiritual, as Paul Cech says, is nothing more than taking responsibility for what you bring into creation moment to moment. And that's essential to De Delhi Lama. Says. So I always joke when people go to me, what well, like what are those Delhi Lama books like? And in Ireland, we have a saying here. So like in Ireland, if, if like, if someone said to me, what's Jeremy like? And I'm like, 
obviously I love you. I think you're you're an amazing human being. I would say oh he's he's sound, like he's a sound human. So uh, people always ask about uh, the Dalai Lama. I go, what's what's the Dalai Lama saying in those books? And I say, essentially, he just says, you don't need to be religious to be a sound person. Like, you can just be a good person without having to be religious. So I always say that to people. But um, yeah, that's that's what that reminds me of. Stephen Covey, seek, seek, first to, seek first to understand and then to be understood, as you said, with the art of the pause. So uh, yeah, it's really, really great stuff. And, and as you were saying to me there too, your three things may change. And I think a key thing to understand is that it's completely okay. Ralph Waldo Emerson's another guy who's impacted me in his writings. It's so funny, isn't it? Like that a guy who lived in the middle of the 19th century when there was no internet, no like electricity wasn't, wasn't even getting around about them. Was it probably was actually it was because it was around the time of civil war and there was more to go, but like there was no internet, there was no TV. And like this guy from the middle of the 19th century, like his writings, you know, are so profound, but he talks about like, let yourself be authentic moment to moment. He's like, so what if you contradict yourself yesterday? We authentic yesterday. If you were, he says, well, then that's the whole point. Like, he's like, we're too afraid that somebody will recall and say, Oh, but you said this back then is like, yeah, but life is all about growth and learning and journey. So like, don't take me for who I was then take me for who I am right now in this moment in time. So just going off your thing of like my three things could change tomorrow. It's like, that's because it's meant, that's meant to be part of the process. Whereas, you know, some people are so identified to a belief, and it's an ego thing and it's a safety blanket because it adds a bit of certainty into their lives. And they're, they're afraid then that if, mm, I kind of don't believe that anymore, but then I'm afraid people will judge me that I'm contradicting myself. And, you know, it's just, uh, that's what all that reminds me of. So that's my little ramble done there. Are we going to drop the mic with that? <laughs> I, I won't drop this because it costs an awful lot of money and OPEX paid for it. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, wrapping up here, um, that was your, your top lessons, which was great. What would your top resources be to everyone watching and listening to this? And the resource can be any, it can be a book, it can be an online source, it could be a person, it could be a place. And then after you, you, you give your top resource, what would your top life advice be to everyone listening and watching them? I know this, this could be a few minutes, but you take however long you want. So resource and life advice. Well, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to beat your book list. So uh, what, what I'll say is, uh, you know, certainly, you know, readers are leaders. So, you know, you, you always got to be learning. Uh, but if you want to talk about energy, like, I mean, I got an email from a co-op student this morning that worked with us for four months. And that email for me is, is energy, right? Like that, her recounting her experience and how, you know, she's never worked in a co-op placement because, you know, she's, she's in school and co-op students are given a list of things to do and they're micromanaged or disregarded. And, you know, she felt like, you know, like we really, really worked her hard and she felt like, you know, she grew because of it, but she never felt overworked because she had support. And, um, you know, I think like that's like when you see the result of your hard work, at least this is true for me, when you see the result of it in other people, that is a return in the energy. Yeah. In fact, that's like an upswing for me. Uh, and so the, the simple life advice that I'd, I'd give is because it is simple and profound and yet on the other side of complexity because it took me a long time to understand this. And, and it's, again, something that Dan Paff um, makes simple because that's what he does is pay it forward, mm. right? So if somebody gives you something, uh, even if they're not expecting something in return, um, which, which is like, you know, Dan's been a huge mentor for me. He's like, Dan, like, how do I compensate you? And, you know, he's like, just pay it forward. Like do that for someone else. So yeah, that's, that's my simple life. Advice. You know, it's, uh, I just got a, like massive chill down my back there because only lately. So Mike Boyle has been a mentor to me and he always says that when he does something, he's like pay forward. And then I also had two, um, what was it? In incidents isn't the right word. Two, two things that have happened lately where someone did some unbelievably nice for me. And when I thanked them, that, that was just, they just said paid for it, paid for it. And uh, so those two individuals, they, they, they just like completely out of the blue, like just a, big, a box came. One was a book with a hoodie and a card. And it was just like thanking me for like my work. And this was from a, a an individual who's pretty well known within the physical therapy field. And then another was from 
um, one of my lecturers on my master's course sent me a book that was like a hundred euro. And like, he just like, cause he heard on one of my podcast episodes that I was like, oh, I'm a bit broke at the moment paying my college fees. So I'll have to wait to get this book that I want to get. And he just sent it to me and it was just like, yeah, just, and, and when I thanked him and said, well, I, I don't know like what to say or do, they're just like pay it forward. And Dan has said the same thing to me as well. It's just all these great guys seem to say the same thing. It's just pay it forward. And uh, it's just, it's just, it's so, uh, it's perfect that you just said that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll throw one more thing in out there because we did start with like, you know, how this, you know, athletic gen and the educational journey and my, my PhD supervisor uh, forward, like what, after I defended my thesis, after I, you know, got the accreditations, et cetera, you know, I, I was like, dude, like I got way more questions than I had when I came in here. I'm not sure that I contributed very much. I don't think I'm ready. And he's like, that's how I know you're ready. So to, to folks like who are listening, like, so, I, I, I mean, something I constantly have to remind myself, and I'm not good at it, by the way, is accepting that like when you arrive at the thing that you thought you were searching for, like it's, it may not be an answer. It yeah. may be a better question. So, and that's, that's okay. So. My thought on that would be is that just, just from my, my current, and I always very, you, 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 you spoke earlier on about being very intentional with our words. And that's something I've begun to appreciate so much more because my words can have such a powerful impact on people. It's, it's unbelievable. Like even so the Somebody really smart told me that words are a form of technology, right? Yeah. They are a technology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, In fact, really all of our technologies that are out there today that we, that are making a difference are in some way, shape or form about allowing people to communicate mm. better. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. But just going on, on what you said there in terms of, you know, you, you think you get the answer and it's, it's another question. And like, uh, I said, like my current thought process, that's why I was talking about being very careful with my words because I always make sure I think that my, my current thought would be that, you know, that life is fluid and dynamic and it's a continual journey and there really is no destination. We, we could spend our whole lives saying, when I get to there. And it's kind of like life is going, you'll see, you'll see. And it's kind of like the thing to see was that there was nothing to see. It was just the whole process and the journey and everything. And, you know, I often heard about Alan Watts and some of his lectures that I listen to when I go for a walk and, you know, in one of his lectures, he says, he, you know, he asks the guy who studied some Zen Buddhism, like, what did you learn after your 20, 25 years studying under Zen, the Zen Buddhist masters? And he goes, nothing. And that's what I was meant to learn. <laughs> and it was to come to a place of acceptance and appreciation that we just can't know anything with any certainty. And I, I've spoken about this so many times. This was the actual thing I meditated most on in Altus. And I don't know why it was at Altus. I don't know why, what Altus did to bring this thought process out. But the biggest thing I meditated on, I've said this in numerous other podcasts, was the, this idea of certainty in our lives. Um, in that most humans, or what I'm seeing in humans, in myself too, is that whether it be a religious belief, a political belief, an ideological, an, 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 a belief in an ideology, or a habit or habits we seem to want to ingrain or instill a sense of certainty into our lives because the biggest question every single human has, whether they think about it consciously, moment to moment, day to day, week to week, etc., or subconsciously they just shove it in the back of their mind and don't want to think about it, is death. Because none of us know what's next. And that cloud of uncertainty hangs over every single person. And some people are better at thinking and dealing with it than others. But what a lot of us do is, and again, this could be more aware to some people or more subconscious others, is that we start then to ingrain like elements of certainty in our lives. And they can become masks of ego. And if they become attacked, we become very defensive of it. So again, like I'm Catholic, I'm a Protestant, I'm a Muslim, I'm Jewish, or I'm a 100 meter sprinter, I am a doctor, I am a musician, where we're putting all these masks on and never really asking, well, who am I and why am I here? And, and like the whole thing is that we don't know and we're not meant to know. And it's, it's part yeah, of the whole and, beautiful journey, you know? And I guess the point is you could be any of those things or all of those things. And absolutely. That's exactly it. Yeah. And, and that's literally in your DNA. Right. So, you know, to, you know, to, we can drop yeah. the mic. We can drop the mic on that one. That was pretty good. Well, exactly. So like the, you have this technology, what you do with it is, is up to you but don't you want to understand 
who you are. So. Yeah, man. Last two, for whatever reason, and uh, you, you're actually probably the ideal person to say this to because you, you could potentially get the best information to actually make this maybe possible. But for whatever reason, just hypothetically, you only have one year left on planet Earth. How would you spend that year? I should have asked you for these questions ahead of time. Actually, no, it's better that you didn't. No, no, no I was going to say no. Yeah, it has to be authentic in the moment. There is no right or wrong. If I had one year, well, I'd want to, I'd, I'd, I'd want to like get a disguise and like, like be like a Jedi and just like, just run around the world doing random good things for people. That'd be amazing. That's a yeah, great I'd answer. Like, I have the sweater and everything with the hoodie. So like, that's, that's what I'd want to do. I could see that happening. Like somebody, like somebody, like got like uh, I don't know, like they, their their car got like I don't know, clamped. It's like, yeah, this guy's came out of nowhere and like paid my fine. He was like so nice. Right? Yeah, <laughs> or, like has that ever happened to you? And it like changes your life, and you don't even know who that person was. And it's just like, wow, I just like feel so much better knowing that that person exists. Yeah, that's yeah. why I like I like to do that. Like, just ra- random like, random acts of kindness all day long, all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last one. We're going to leave it on this. This is the big question. I, I always love asking people this one. So where, uh, where, wherever you are in the world, let's just say you're, you're in Arizona and I'm back in Arizona. We just happen to be in the same place. And I say, hey, Jeremy, want to go for dinner? And you're like, absolutely. And I say, right, I've got magic powers. And you're like, okay, explain. I'm like, I can bring people back from the dead. And you're like, mm, I'm kind of second thinking this dinner. I'm like, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Let me explain. Let me explain. So we're going to go to dinner and I ask, I say that you can bring five people to this dinner that we're going to, and they can be either dead or alive. Who would you bring to this dinner and why? Uh, bring the five that we talked about, right? So mom, dad, uh, Ford, Dan, and Alan Watts. How freaking Good. cool would that be? Yeah, I'm absolutely cool with that. That would be some dinner. I'd love to hear Alan Watts. Uh, you know, I, I forgot about Bruce Lee. And I can't sub out anybody, but I'm just saying Bruce Lee would be freaking cool too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get him in there. I'll, I'll bend. I make the rules. I can make it happen. <laughs> well, you do have magical powers. That's yeah. very true. It's very true. Not, not as good as Jesus, though. I can't turn uh, bread into boogie. Did you ever see Family Guy? For my next trick, oh, it's water into boogie. Water into boogie. <laughs> and on that note... We, we shall wrap up. Jerry, is there anything else that you uh, you want to say before we wrap up in terms of uh, where can people find out more? Obviously, I'm going to put everything in the notes about Alletogen. Is there social media, Facebook, Twitter? You're on all those as well? Yeah. Yeah, you can find, I mean, we have, uh, you know, our Twitter is, I believe it's Athletogen. Our Instagram is Athletogen Official. Yeah. You can find all that on our webpage, athletogen.com. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty easy to find. And, um, you know, since this is, after all, I'm looking at the logo, OPEX Fitness Explained, uh, one of the things that I'll, you know, invite people to consider, you know, because I, I do this every, now, now that I don't, I'm not training for a specific competition, but, you know, fitness and movement is a huge part of my life. That's where, you know, my meditation happens, my moving meditation. But, you know, I'd ask people to ask themselves why they're doing it, because it's really easy to get caught up into, you know, a program, for an outcome that they may not even want. Yeah. Uh, so to you know, bring, bring that intention to what they choose to put their body through because they only get one. They Amazing. Have one body. Amazing. All right, we're going to wrap up there. So for all the viewers, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the OPEX YouTube channel and the listeners subscribe to OPEX on whatever podcast app you like to listen to, um, iTunes or Stitcher or any other ones. But uh, that's it from me. So from Robbie Burke for OPEX podcast fitness explained and from dr jeremy uh thanks so much jeremy for making time today i really do appreciate it so uh you want to say goodbye to the viewers and listeners yeah and you know i want to i'm very honored that you considered me and i'm very thankful to the the listeners and viewers to uh um i guess entertain us by by listening so thank you great stuff all right guys peace